Yeah. Now, <clears throat> we are now recording. Let me get the slide set up. And uh, a really important announcement I have not made before. I just got this email in uh, to read it. Since class, I don't remember what, I guess it was Monday, I printed it off, okay? Yesterday. Now, you should have been notified of this, have you been, that the online evaluations for the first mini-term courses have been open? Yes. Okay, good. Um, how many of you have done them yet? All right. Please do those. You want to wait a little bit later, you can. But please don't put them off and then forget to do them. We really need to have those evaluations. I don't know if y'all realize what's happening around the school now. Every 10 years, we have to be reaccredited by the National Accrediting Agency. Actually, it's a regional accrediting agency, but they work with, you know, across the country and try to keep everything about the same. Uh, Diego's here. If I can find you, there you are. All right, and uh, so this, actually next year is our year, but this is the year we're getting ready for them, and they are really wanting us to look good before the thing. And one of the things that the crediting agency looks at, they send the team in here. I mean, it's a huge team. I'm guessing five, six, seven people and they look over everything. In fact, they're looking over the stuff right now electronically, but then they'll actually come to campus and really do a physical check to make sure we are doing everything we say we are electronically. So, uh, evaluations is one of those. They will look and see what percentage of the students are responding, you know, blah, blah, blah. They, won't, they may look at the numbers themselves, but they are looking at how many students participate in the evaluation process. So please, please get the evaluations done. And like I said, you can wait until later in the term if you want to, but please don't put it off and then forget about it. Because I would be tempted to do that with things that I put off, I tend to forget. And so do them while you're thinking of it. All right. Does anyone have any issue with them? You don't know how to do the evaluations or I uh, take it all of you have done one before, done them before, right? Have you ever had any problem doing them? Okay. So check your email. Uh, it says students have been notified that the spring 2019 mini term one end of term surveys are available. Okay. Um, we value your responses. Your login, I'll just say this again, is your seven digit student ID number. Okay. I don't know, do yours start with any special digits? I don't guess so. Yeah, they could be just about anything. Um, and then your uh, I guess it's the password is your date of your birth. But the date is given in year, four digit year, two digit month, two digit day. For an old coot like me, it would be 1951, believe it or not, 01 for January and 07 for the day. Okay? So be sure you put zeros in for uh, missing digits and stuff like that. So everybody uh, knows how to do this and we'll get these done, right? Please. Thank you. The other thing announcement was about the Alabama AM North Scholarship. Have I told you about that before? Uh, basically, they'll pay you if you, there are certain stipulations, but if you agree to teach math or science, I can't remember how many other fields are included in it, uh, for a certain number of years, they will pay your senior, junior and senior year. Pay completely for that. So please, folks, uh, consider that. Patel is here. All right. Now. Let's uh, talk before we get going today on how today is going to go, approximately. 
going to get started in chapter 23 because we did finish chapter 20 last time. Okay? That's coming up for something else. So we'll get started in 23 today. Notice we're skipping 21 and 22. We just don't have time for them. And by the way, I was just trying to figure how many weeks do we have left in the term? We have this week, next week, and what? The full week. Does that include finals? That's what no, I'm finals wondering. finals is the first week of March. What's that? Finals is the first week of March, so we have like two weeks of class. I'm pretty sure. Okay. We have class this week, next week, and finals are the following week. Okay, but we do have one class that, that, that week, right? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, now, one reason I'm bringing that up, we are tentatively scheduled for a trip to the planetarium on Tuesday, one week from today. Uh, are y'all wanting to do it? I know it's been a long time since we did astronomy, but are you wanting to, to participate in the field trip? Yay or nay? Okay. Uh, and that would mean we'd be leaving here, that means next Tuesday, we'll be leaving here at 1.15, okay? I can't hang around because he's going to start at 2 o'clock, okay? And it takes, depending on traffic, it could take a pretty close to 45 minutes to get there. Okay? So, um, does anyone prefer to have a ride? As in, we get the van for next Tuesday. Or are you all, all happy to drive yourselves? We will be coming back here to campus afterwards. The, he'll go for about an hour, hour and a half, or I'm guessing. So he's going to be through by 3, 3.15, maybe 3.30. And then we've got plenty of time to come back here and, and wrap up things here. So I will be coming back to campus, which I hope y'all will be coming back to campus too. Um, so is there no interest in, a, in transportation? Nobody needs a ride. All right, well, I won't have to worry with the van. But I will tell you, I will be driving, and I can carry comfortably three other people. So if, one, if three people want to ride, you can. But if more than three, I can uh, get the van. Okay? And it will carry, I think, seven or something like that. Uh, I'll see if I can get the van. But y'all don't need transportation. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so let's figure for next Tuesday. Okay, so that gives us today and Thursday, basically, to do Chapter 23. Okay, I believe we can get it done in two days. Then the uh, next Tuesday will be the trip to planetarium, and then we'll come back from that and have the test that uh, have the test on this chapter. Now the lab for this chapter is another field trip, and that's the one to uh, Channel 13 Weather Center. Okay, Jerry Tracy, I know, and uh, we go to the same church. And he is always good to host us uh, to go there. Uh, do y'all, that is the lab for that one. Now, both of these field trips are optional. You don't have to go. I can't force you to go. Uh, but you get uh, basically a bonus 25 points that allows you to drop a, your, a next lowest lab score. So, uh, they're, and they are good. They, most people enjoy both of these field trips a lot. So I think you get good stuff out of both of them. So um, it could be that on Thursday of next week we go to Channel 13. Do y'all mind having two field trips in one week? Okay. Um, but in between that, we've got to get 24 done too. Uh, and then we only have Tuesday of that week to wrap that up. So but we can't have the test on 24 the same day we have the final exam. Because the final exam is going to not take you long at all. And the lab for 24 is a very short lab, too, so we can get that done. So I think we can probably squeeze it all in. It hurt that I wasn't here the first day of class, and so all you got to do was the, the uh, video stuff. Uh, we could have gotten some stuff covered then, and then it really hurt when we missed that day of class because of all the snow we got that day, if you remember. So it's going to be pushing it. So let's go on and get started. So that's what we'll do for this. Then, the uh, 
We'll go from now until 315. We'll stop this and then do the lab for chapter 20. This is directly tied, but it, it has something to do with 20. Okay, and then the last 30 minutes will be the test on 20. So if you didn't do your formula and equation sheet for chapter 20, you might be working on that too, because that will be the last 30 minutes today. Okay, sound like a plan. So that means Thursday we'll have two and a half hours, because we're not going to finish chapter 23 today. So we'll have two and a half hours to do uh, work on chapter 23. And then since there is no lab for this chapter except for the field trip, we'll probably get started on 24 on Thursday as well. 24 is going to be sort of a long day, okay? We've had several days that we've had short lectures because we've had labs and tests. 23 will not be, I mean, uh, Thursday will not be that kind of day. Then Tuesday will be mostly field trip, but we'll come back from that and work on finishing 24. And then Thursday, if we don't have a field trip that day, or even if we do, we'll try to finish 24. So then the Tuesday of the next week, we can have the test and lab, lab and test for, for uh, chapter 20. Oh, we got to have the test for 23, too. We'll squeeze in the test for 23 sometime, and we'll also then have the lab and test for 24, and then the last day have the final exam. I think we can do it, but I need to get talking. Any questions before we go? Now, I remember someone asked me to carry uh, several tests with me over to the Birmingham campus last Friday. And the person never showed up. Okay, I can't remember who it was. I carried them over there, but He's they didn't. Not here. Huh? He's not here. Right. Who was it? Which it one? Was the guy who um, sits behind Thomas. Who I believe that one day at two o'clock to go. Oh, I know, Gavin. Gavin. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, he didn't show because he's usually over there, and he, I don't know what happened. Anyway, uh, I've got him back here, but that's fine. All right. Any questions? All right, weather and climate, that's chapter 23. Here's the core concept that you will find on page 573 of your text. Solar, and, and actually a little bit of difference here. Here's the one from the previous edition. Solar radiation drives cycles in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, that, we had to skip chapter 22. As you're reading chapter 23, you might want to go back and read chapter 22 as well. Hint, hint, read the chapters, okay? Uh, so that's when they talked about the Earth's atmosphere. I'll bring you up to speed as much as I can on what we need for this time. So solar radiation drives the cycles, notice this, the cycles in the Earth's atmosphere, and some of those cycles determine weather and some determine climate. The title of this is Weather and Climate, and we're going to kind of do it that way. First half, or first part, weather part, second part, climate part. Anyone have sort of an idea of what is weather, climate, and what's the difference? Any ideas? Weather is what's happening today, you know. Temperature, rainfall, humidity, whatever. That's the weather. The cycle of that, you know, that's the weather. Climate is what happens on the long haul, okay? What, you know, has typically happening at this time of year or any year, okay? It's the long view. Now, I said this is slightly different from what's in your book, where here it says solar radiation. In your text, it says solar energy drives cycles in the Earth's atmosphere, and some of these cycles determine weather and climate. So the only difference is the word energy. Okay, radiation or energy. I guess someone objected and said they thought energy was a better word, so not that it matters. Same principle is involved, radiation or energy. Radiation is the type of energy, okay, that, so, that the sun gives us. Anyone got an idea what this is a picture of? Stretch your imagination a little bit. 
pretty much the Gulf of Mexico. Here's Florida. Now it's under cloud cover, so you can't see a direct outline. Here's Florida. Uh, here's probably southern Alabama, somewhere about in here. Maybe not that far, but maybe somewhere here. Louisiana is somewhere under all this cloud cover here. And here's the Texas coast, probably down in New Mexico here, somewhere here. Uh, this is Cuba, somewhere under those clouds, and that's basically the Gulf of Mexico. As you can tell, weather is a happening. It always is a happening, okay? Right now, we're in a pattern of weather that is just coming up from somewhere here, just bringing rain after rain after rain. I don't know if it's coming from the Gulf of Mexico or it's from the Pacific. I think it's coming from the Pacific because they were saying there's a band of snow and ice, a winter storm, going from Oklahoma as it's going to be going toward the northeast. So I think that we're the warm tail of that. It doesn't feel that warm, but at least it's not snow and ice. Okay. So anyway, there's our core concept. So let's talk about the things that create. Well, a lot of weather comes from clouds and, as in today, precipitation. Okay, this leads to what we call the hydrologic cycle. How many chapters have started or ended with a cycle of some type? The rock cycle, the uniform principle of uniformity, diastrophism, they've all been coming and reproducing in cycles. Okay? And here is basically, now what do we mean by hydrologic? Any idea? Talked about this a little bit last time. Prefix hydro or hydre would be water, exactly. This is the water cycle. Now, where is most of the water on the planet? Anybody? Where's most of the water on the planet? The oceans. What? Two-thirds, three-quarters of the Earth's surface is covered with water. Some of that water is pretty deep, miles deep, okay? Even our little Gulf of Mexico down there, the depth can go well over a mile, okay? There's a lot of water on the surface of the Earth, okay? Most of it over the ocean. Now, most of the energy from the planet comes from the sun, exactly, okay? Well, the sun heats the water in the ocean any time of year, but especially in the tropics and, you know, uh, any time of year and in the temperate areas, more in the summer, the winter, but it's still heating the ocean. And when it heats the water in the ocean, the water evaporates, okay? That's why the oceans are salty, by the way. The fresh water evaporates out and the salts that are there get concentrated. But there's always, we'll see that. Okay, so first step, evaporation from the oceans, okay? Now what happens then, when they get into the, the evaporated water goes into the atmosphere, especially if it moves up, somewhere out there it gets cooler, okay? Warm down here on the ocean, but somewhere high enough up and it starts cooling off. When it starts cooling, you get clouds forming, okay? The little, the, the uh, uh, evaporated water now starts collecting little droplets. Well, the winds come along and push the clouds. Now, not all the clouds get pushed over land, but some of them do. Some of the clouds just go to another part of the ocean, and then they dump there, okay? But those clouds that do get pushed over land, then it's quite common, as is happening today. The temperature is low enough that the water in the clouds starts precipitating out. That's precipitation. Precipitation doesn't mean water. It doesn't mean rain. Precipitate means to fall. Think of a precipice. It's a crack, a, a, something there that you could easily fall into. So precipitation is to fall out. Precipitation of water is water falling out of the clouds onto either the ocean or the land. Okay. So first, it's evaporated from the ocean. Second, it's transported uh, through the atmosphere as the winds and other uh, things happen. And then, 
as it cools, the water condenses. That's the reverse operation of, of evaporation. Evaporation is going from a liquid to a gas. Uh, condensation is going from a gas to a liquid. Okay? So it condenses and falls. Precipitate. Precipitation. Rain. Or snow. Or sleet. Or hail. You know, that kind of stuff. Okay? And then, especially even this that falls onto land, ultimately will make its way back to the ocean. Now, there could be one that ultimately could involve a short period of time, a number of days, almost immediate, a number of weeks, a number of months, a number of years, a number of decades, a number of centuries, a number of millennia, but at some point it all makes its way back. Most of it is a fairly short circuit there. Now there's many smaller sub-cycles, for instance, coming from the ocean, getting to the clouds, going to a cooler spot, and falling back into the ocean. That misses land altogether. Okay, so there's many ways. And then there's sub-cycles over here, too. This water could fall over, say, a, a stream that takes it to a big lake somewhere, and the lake it evaporates and comes out again. So, yeah, there could be other sub-cycles in here, but overall, this is the pattern. And once it's in the ocean, it goes back. Now, remember I said the saltiness of the ocean? When it hits the land, it dissolves more salts and takes them into the ocean. Okay? Now, that would indicate the ocean just going to keep getting salty. But no, really, it's at an equilibrium. Because sometime, at some point, the salts that are in the ocean are going to precipitate out, not as water, but as solids, in the bottom of the ocean and forming limestone, forming uh, other materials, and gets back into the rock cycle. Okay? So, lots of cycles going on here. Okay. So let's start with that evaporation of the water from the ocean or from a lake or from a stream or from a bowl of dog water or whatever. It's, it's going to evaporate. Okay. And when it evaporates at some point, if there's enough of it there, it's going to form a cloud. Well, what is that process? Clouds form when air masses are cooled to their dew point. What in the world do we mean by dew point? Anyone have an idea? Any idea at all? Okay. Let me ask you a question. What temperature of air do you think is going to hold more moisture? Warm air or cool air? Cool? Hold more moisture, not give it up, hold it, okay? The warm air, because the warm air, the molecules are further apart, there's more room for water to get in there, okay? Now that's why in the summertime, here in the southeast, people will say, it's not so much the heat, it's the... You've never heard people say that. Humidity. What do they mean by that? Humidity is how much water is being held by the air. And in the summertime, when it's nice and hot, and we've got all this water all around us, the Gulf of Mexico to the south of us, all these rivers, lakes, and everything, and we rain like this, there's a lot of humidity in the air. And it'll hold more in the summertime than it will in the winter. Now, why the humidity makes you feel so miserable is... What is your air conditioning system? This morning, they took my temperature, and my temperature was something like 98.3, I believe it was. Okay, this is close to normal. Okay, wait a minute. The temperature in the room was no more than 70, probably, and the temperature outside was much cooler than that. How in the world was I at, well, how was I at 98.3? or 0.6, or whatever. We are machines, and we're operating, and the operation produces heat. Right now, for many of you who have just finished lunch, uh, or have eaten lunch at some time, or even breakfast, or whatever, 
You intook food. Most of that food had calories. The calories are the things that oxidize, you know, the food that you eat oxidizes and that gives off heat. So we are in an equilibrium of about 98.6, 98.3, something like that. Temperature just about all the time. Okay? Now, it's not hard to stay cool enough at this time of year because the room temperature is low, the outside temperature is low, but and even when there's that much moisture in the air. But in the summertime, how do we keep cool? Your own physical system of keeping cool. How do we do it? How does your body keep from overheating? Yes, you perspire, you sweat, okay? But that itself doesn't lose you a lot of heat. What loses you the heat is when the sweat evaporates off your skin. Because every time for every gram, gram of water that evaporates off your skin, that takes 540 calories of energy to do that. So that's how you keep cool. You sweat. And the more you exercise, the more you sweat, and the more you need to do it. But guess what? If that air out there, and this happens in the summertime, is so full of moisture, you're not going to be able to evaporate any because it's already full. The humidity is so high, it won't accept anymore. So there you sit with sweat all over you, but not being able to evaporate it, you overheat. And that's why people in the summertime will get heat strokes and, and pretty serious conditions. That's why, you know, a child left in a car or an animal left in a car with the windows up in the summertime, they can die of heat exhaust. They can't cool their bodies fast enough to overcome that heat, okay? And part of the reason for that is and that's not being close in a car, that's a different issue, but that is they can't evaporate. Well, why can't they evaporate? Because the air won't take any more moisture. It will not evaporate anymore, okay? Well, how does that relate to dew point? At any given temperature, let me phrase it this way. Right now, I would guess the humidity outside is awfully close to 100%. It may be 90, 95, 97, 88, something like that. Awfully high because it's raining, okay? In other words, the air will not accept any more moisture. It's losing the moisture it's got, okay? But it's cool enough that we don't have any problem with not being able to sweat because we, we cool off just being out there. But in the summertime, when the outside temperature is close to our body temperature, we can't lose much of the air, so that depends on the sweat, okay? Now, the dew point is the temperature at which, okay, it's hard to describe this when it's raining outside, okay? But before it started raining, I it started sometime yesterday, didn't it? Was it yesterday evening? Sometime. Whenever it started, at that point, the air was pretty high in humidity. In other words, it had just about all the humidity it could hold. But when the temperature cooled so it couldn't even hold what it did have, that's when it starts condensing. That's the dew point. It's the temperature at which the air will start losing it's moisture. We passed that point sometime last night. We reached our dew point. We're still at our dew point. That's why it keeps raining. Okay? So the clouds form when the air masses, which have evaporated water in them, you don't see the water. It's just out there in the air. It's sort of like, okay, when you're cooking food or something, you're boiling water. You may see the steam coming up right off the water, but after a while, you don't see it anymore. It fills the air. It gets into the air. Now, if you were to hold a cool plate somewhere up there 
above that pot of water that was boiling, you don't see the steam making it to the plate, but you'll still see water droplets form on the plate because the moisture that's in the air, that plate is cool, it will start, you know, make the air right around it reach its dew point and then it starts coming out. That's what the dew point is. The temperature at which any given body of air saturates. All of the water that it can hold is in the air. After that, it starts condensing. Well, that's what's happening when the clouds form. This evaporated water, which you don't see, it's in the air, evaporated, and it goes up there, and then at some point it cools. Like I said, as you go up in the atmosphere, it gets cooler and cooler and cooler, and at some point the air reaches its dew point, and that's when the clouds form. That means it can't hold the moisture anymore, so they start uh, aggregating in little bitty droplets. It's generally cooled by that upward movement, and that's called convection. Okay? Now, does anyone have a good definition or understanding of what convection is? The best single phrase for it that I can think of is hot air rises. Now, why does hot air rise? Remember what I said? When something is heated, it's got more energy. The molecules bump into each other harder, faster, and therefore they expand. And when the air expands, it takes up more space, but for the same amount of air. So the, the density of air, density of anything, is the amount of mass in a given volume. And when the volume expands, but the mass doesn't, the density is lower. Okay? When the density is lower, it tends to rise, and cooler air comes in underneath. That's what convection is. The rising of the warm air and the bringing down of the cool air. All right. Knock on wood on this one. This winter, I think I've had less upper respiratory problems than I have any winter I can ever think of. Now, you might say, well, we haven't had that cold of a winter, and that may be part of it. But the other part of it is that even though we tried, we knew about this, we seldom did it, but this year we have been very regular. My wife and I both have humidifiers near the bed, okay? And in other words, especially in the wintertime, the heat comes on, heats up the air in the house, and that makes more room for moisture, but there's no moisture there. The humidity inside a building is typically much lower than it is outside the building because in the wintertime you're heating the air inside, driving the relative humidity way down. In the summertime, your air conditioning system, even though it's cooling the air, it takes the moisture out ahead of time. Okay, The air conditioning system has a drain on it, a condensate drain that, that hauls the water out of there. So just about any time during the year, but especially in the wintertime, the the warm air is much drier inside a house, okay? So we've been running a humidifier. And when you turn that on, you see that little vapor trail coming out, but then it disappears, you know, because it gets into the air that's dry and, and low humidity, and it evaporates. Well, that is the, uh, the uh, reverse of this, okay? That is the evaporation into the air. When then the air is cooled, which it doesn't happen in the uh, house at this time of year, but it can happen on the windows. And if you're running that humidifier and the windows are cool, you'll see little droplets of air, of, of water, on the, uh, on the window pane. If the, if, now we have um, storm windows, so we don't get that a lot because that, that helps keep us from losing that much heat. So we don't get as much of that, but uh, places where I've lived before without the uh you can definitely see the condensation there. So convection is that moving upward of warm air and reducing of the cold, cooler air. Now, so that's what's happening. The warm, sometimes moist warm air moves up, the cooler air comes underneath. Well, that moist warm air will then hit some sort of barrier. The barrier may be a really high level 
of the atmosphere that is very cold. That may be the barrier. Or it could blow over land and hit a mountain range. Okay. Now, if you remember the pictures we saw of Mount Rainier, Mount Shasta, Mount Hood, most of those tall mountains, what were they? What was on top of those mountains generally? Think of the last chapter, a couple of chapters. Snow. Sometimes year-round. Why? Because at very high elevations, it's cold. It's cold up there. And uh, this is sort of sad now, but it used to be. Does anyone ever hear of Mount Kilimanjaro? Okay, it's in Kenya. Right close to the equator where it never gets cool, at sea level anyway. But Mount Kilimanjaro is one of the taller mountains in the world. Now, it's not as high an elevation as the Himalayas, but it's tall because the, the base land around it is really low, and it goes way up there. And at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, it used to always have snow. In fact, Ernest Hemingway wrote a novel or a short story or something, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. Okay, I've never read it, but it's, a, it's an interesting title. The sad news is, with global warming, there are no snows on Kilimanjaro anymore. There used to be. Back when Hemingway was alive, what, in the 1920s or something like that, there were snows on Mount Kilimanjaro. There aren't anymore. Okay, that's a different story. But anyway, those mountains ranges can form a barrier and they're always way up there and cool and where those that warm moist air off the ocean comes in hits the cool mountains and there uh, that can cause precipitation so the convection holds the moisture up the the winds or the motion of the earth or something carries it somewhere else you hit a barrier like a mountain range or just an air mass with different density, and that can form this. That's basically what's been happening here. Um, this has been the strangest winter. Um, my wife and I sort of have a, a thing going that we say, okay, is it a heavy jacket day or is it a light jacket day? Okay, because it's changed. I mean, We'll have a 60 degree day, and then a couple of days later it'll be 40 degrees. And one night recently it was 47 when I put the dog out at night, and when I got up the next morning it was 52. How did the temperature go up overnight? It's supposed to get cooler at night. The sun was set. It actually went up. Why? Because there was an air mass, probably coming from the Gulf of Mexico, bringing up nice warm air. And then here came a cold front. It's, it's no 62 out there today or 52 out there today. It's in the 40s. And that air came from the north. That same system that's bringing snow to further north, a winter storm further north. And that cold air mass collides with the warm air mass. So the convection takes it up off the Gulf of Mexico, brings it inland, hits that air mass, and we get rain. Okay? The cloud formation depends on the atmospheric stability. Now this is a concept that I really don't like the way the book presents it. If we get to go here, Jerry Tracy, he always says it a lot better than the book does, in my mind anyway. But here's what we mean by atmospheric stability. A stable atmosphere means that a lifted parcel of air convection, the parcel of air is being lifted, is cooler and denser than the surrounding air. <coughs> now, frankly, to me, that sounds like that's an unstable situation, but it's not. That's what they call stable. It's cooler and denser than the surrounding air. The lifted parcel returns to its original level. That's stable, okay, because it wants to go back to some places when it's cooler uh, and denser than the surrounding air, it wants to move back down, and it does. The unstable atmosphere is when the lifted parcel of air is warmer and less dense than the surrounding air, and now it wants to keep going up. It moves on to a higher level, continuing to rise 
and at some point it'll hit a cooler area and then you have instability. See, this is stable for it to go back to where it needs to be. This is unstable for it to get way out of place and then have to regain its stability. Or that's the way this book presents it. Jerry Tracy has a lot better one. He said, now this was from back in the day when he could do this. Anyone know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is? Who? Uh, he's really buff Austrian. Yes. He was Mr. Universe at one time. He also became governor of California at one time, you know. Uh, and he was very strong. That's why Jerry Tracy uses him. He said, really, Arnold Schwarzenegger, in his day anyway, I don't know if he can still do this, could probably have come in and lifted Jerry Tracy into the air without too much effort. That would be a stable situation. He said, however, if I got under Arnold Schwarzenegger and tried to lift him, that would not be a stable situation. I'm going to fall, okay? And that's sort of what it's talking about here. When the things are moving in the way they should be moving, that's stable. When they get out of hand, you might say, that becomes unstable. And basically, well, we'll I'll show you this in a minute. Now, they, they have down here thermals. And thermal is this lifting of a parcel of air because it's warmer and less dense. That's what a thermal is. It's an area, I don't know if you've ever watched an eagle fly. I've never seen that many eagles. Hawk, yeah, probably a little bit more so. But the bird that I've seen that, oh, if you've ever been to the beach, the seagulls. Yeah, you probably have seen them. And, uh, but where I grew up, the bird that illustrated this best was the buzzard. I, that's not a very attractive bird, but if you've ever watched them fly, what they do, they just spread out their wings and they seem like they fly, you know? Well, they got a flash when they get going, but what they do, they catch these thermals, these areas where the, the warm air is rising, and they just ride them with hardly any effort at all, it looks like, okay? And that's what a thermal is. When we were out west with my wife's family vacationing, we've done it a couple of times, either in the Tetons or other places like this. Most memorable was the Tetons. There were some what I consider crazy people that were paying to jump off a mountain, okay? Uh, of course, they were with somebody who had these big tight light sails. Uh, you know, somebody knew what they were doing. They were strapped in there well, and they would literally run off the mountain, and then they catch the thermals with their sail, and they glide. And they catch those thermals and ride them just as far as they could. But at some point, they're going to make their way to the land. Those are the thermals. That rising of the warm parcel, you know, less dense moving up through the surrounding air. That's why they throw them in there. Has nothing to do with that or very little to do with unstable atmosphere. So here is the illustration. And this, again, I don't look at this and say, oh yeah, okay. Um, this is the temperature of the rising. Okay, this is increasing temperature this way, uh, increasing altitude this way, okay. When this parcel of air is cooler and less dense than the surrounding air, here's the temperature of the surrounding air, its temperature is here, it's going to want to head downward because it's cooler and denser than the surrounding air. And if it does that, that's not an issue. Okay? And again, this illustration does almost nothing for me to clarify and say, oh yeah, I see this now. Whereas on the other hand, if the surrounding air was here and the parcel of air here, it's tending to go up. Well, at some point, this is going to be unstable because it's going to not be able to support itself anymore and then it's going to come back down. Okay? The other one was going to come down anyway. This one is going to go up until it does. Okay? Now, again, I don't find these illustrations particularly instructive but they're in the book, and you need to be able to read and understand what they're talking about. By the way, the first one's on page 575, and no, 
Yeah, and the second one is on page 576. And they actually do have an example here which requires density calculations and other things. Um, it's really sort of involved, but it kind of is made up. If you follow along there, I think you'll probably get a little bit more better idea. But this is using formulas and equations from the first half of the book, which we haven't gone over. So I don't want to make you have to do these. Okay. Now, that's your atmospheric instability and stability. And we'll talk about this a little bit later when we get more specific examples. But that's the general picture. All right. Now, so what you have is this upward mobility uh, of warm air. The warm air can hold more moisture than the cooler air can. So the rising moist air at some point cools and eventually reaches their dew point that temperature it can't hold on to the moisture anymore. It gets saturated. And when that happens, the droplets condense around what we call condensation nuclei. Okay? Now, remember I said if you hold that cold plate up there above the pot of water, you'll see drops of water start forming on it. Okay? Because that is sort of acting like a really big condensation nuclei. What we're talking about in the air is not a plate, because that wouldn't hang up there, but little particles, dust particles, salt particles, you know, crystals, something that's just been carried around in the air, and this moisture, it just can't be supported by the air anymore. It's reached a dew point. It's all crowded. It's held, holding as much moisture as it can. If it can find something to attach itself to, it will. Those are what we mean by the droplets condensing on these condensation nuclei. Now, if you don't have any of those there, you almost always do, you wind up with what you call supersaturated air. The moisture is just somehow hanging in there, but has nowhere to go, and that can be probably a fairly unstable situation as well. But I don't really think that happens all that frequently. Now, the cooling of that rising air is slowed by the release of the latent heat of vaporization. Another, this is another term that's coming from the first half of the book. Okay? Remember I said that every gram of the sweat of your body that evaporates into the air has to have, take up 540 calories. And a gram is a very small amount of mass, okay? Every gram takes 540 calories. That is the latent heat of vaporization, okay? Now, um, this explains some other things, too. Have you ever headed to the beach in the summertime? Why do you go to the beach in the summertime? And especially from where we live here, and I don't really care for going to the beach in the summertime, though it's okay, it's fine and everything. I'd much rather go north, you know, go into the mountains or something like that where it's cooler. But if you're driving down, and I've seen this every time Karen's family has gone, as you're driving down from Birmingham, driving down... Montgomery is almost always hotter in the summertime than, and mostly in the winter too, than Birmingham. It's further south, right? And you keep on going down, and it just seems to get hotter and stickier the more you go down, you know, the further south you go. That's typical here in the Northern Hemisphere, right? But then, sometime right before you get to the beach, you start feeling this cooler air. It's coming off the Gulf of Mexico. Why is the air cooler there? Because this latent heat of vaporization, the, the air is, the, the heat from the sun is vaporizing the water, and for every gram of water vaporized, and there's a lot of grams being vaporized off the Gulf of Mexico, there's 540 calories of heat is required to do that, to evaporate it, okay? Whoa! That's why it feels cooler, okay? There's another reason, too, we'll 
maybe talk about that later. But that's part of it, the latent heat of vaporization. The cooling of the rising air is slowed by the release of latent heat of vaporization. What do I mean by that? That's sort of a double negative. Well, as the water condenses, it gives off 540 calories for every gram that condenses on those condensation nuclei. So that's why the cooling of the rising air is slowed, because now when it condenses, it's giving off heat, not absorbing heat, but giving it off heat, okay, by that release of the latent heat of vaporization. Now it's called the latent heat of condensation as it condenses. Huge numbers of droplets appear as clouds, okay? When you see a cloud out there, and you can probably see, uh, it seems like the whole sky is a cloud now, but on a day when you can see the clouds separately, every one of those clouds are made up of an enormous number of droplets of uh, condensed water. Now, why do clouds look different colors? You see dark, we call thunder clouds, or you see light, white, fluffy clouds. What accounts for that? Light, white, fluffy clouds is when you see the sun reflecting off the clouds. That's why it looks light and fluffy. If you're underneath the cloud and the sun is being reflected somewhere else and you're under the dark side of it then, you don't see any of that. It's the same cloud. If you were up above it, that would look white and fluffy. If you were in a plane flying over that cloud, it would look like white and fluffy. So these droplets can sometimes be dense enough that they block the sun from coming in, and then you get situations. I was just noticing the class I had right before this one started at 11.30, and I got here just a little after 11.30, not a soul was in the room. What was that? Yeah, that's right. Not a soul was in the room. I thought, well, I'll just start recording the, the class. It was a small math class. Uh, and I was just going to use my thing here. I couldn't see well enough to read, hardly because it was so dark outside, the cloud cover has made it dark enough, even in the middle of the day, 1130, you would think it would be pretty bright outside. It wasn't. The clouds were reflecting and blocking all that from coming in. Okay. So, upward mobility, uh, moisture air at some point, the, cloud, the, the moisture condenses around these condensation nuclei. Pieces of dust, salt, whatever. So, now this is the next subtopic in your book, the origins of precipitation. Remember, precipitation means to fall, to fall out. So precipi okay. precipitation is water returning to the Earth's surface, falling out of the sky, okay? Now, not this morning, it was raining. What morning was it? I think it was last Friday. It had been a warm, moist day, pretty much. I may have the day wrong. I believe this was last Friday. Uh, on Thursday, but Friday overnight, it got pretty cool. Wasn't below freezing, but I went out to get in my vehicle to go. I think I was going to the Birmingham campus, is why I was thinking it was Friday. And lo and behold, there was a sheet of frost on my windshield. Now, it had been warm that day before, no rain overnight. Was that frost precipitation? In a warmer time of year, like in the spring, we'll have dew on the grass in the morning. Is that precipitation? No, it didn't fall from the sky. It just existed. Dew and frost are surface processes, not precipitation. They don't fall from the sky. Sure, they come out of the air, but they don't fall from the sky. The air is in the sky, but when the temperature drops overnight and it reaches its dew point, then it's going to precipitate not up there, but on the surface. So that's why they call it a surface process. Precipitation forms in two ways. Okay? Now, remember the last slide left us with droplets in the air, the clouds, around the condensation nuclei. Those little droplets up there, those are forming clouds. They're not heavy enough to fall to Earth. 
Not yet. So there's two ways they come to earth. One is they get so many of them, so dense, so close together, they start bumping into each other and forming bigger droplets. And that's what we mean coalescence. Into cloud droplets, and finally they get heavy enough, they fall. Precipitate to the earth. Okay? The second of these, and we don't realize that an awful lot of our rain comes this way. They just keep going up and up and up until they get in such a cold area, they actually form ice crystals. And those ice crystals, being cold, they other condensed water or evaporated water gets onto those, they get bigger and bigger, and then they fall. They get so massive. So the growth, see the coalescence of cloud droplets, more liquid water, or growth of ice crystals, solid water because they're so far up. So let's look first at the coalescence process. It takes place in the warm, cumulus clouds near the tropic oceans. Now, the Gulf of Mexico is not an ocean, but it would classify as a tropic body of water. Uh, so this is going to be happening in the Gulf of Mexico lots. Okay. Now, especially if it's near the oceans, the clouds will contain... Now, I don't like this term here, giant salt condensation nuclei. That makes it sound like big chunks of salt up there. That couldn't happen because they'd fall out of the sky, okay? So I don't know why they say giant. That just contains little crystals of salt that have blown off the ocean or something like this. Those little crystals of salt, because they like to dissolve in water, they attract water molecules, and they form the condensation nuclei. Like I said, it could be salt, it could be dust, it could be just about anything. Okay, so they form these condensation nuclei, this moist air collects them, and then they bump into each other and coalesce and finally get big enough to come out of the air. They were liquid water, they were vapor, they became liquid, they came out of the air. That's coalescence. The ice crystal process takes place at the clouds in the middle latitudes. Hey, that's where we live. Now, sure, in the summertime, we feel pretty tropical here. Okay, It gets hot, but it just depends. They say warm cumulus clouds near the tropic oceans. We may be close enough that those could be us. I think more likely what is happening is we're in the really tall cumulus cloud they go way, way up into the atmosphere, and there the ice crystals form. Okay, the ice crystals capture nearby water molecules and grow, and grow, and grow. And finally, and I mean not huge, because they're going to fall as soon as they get heavy enough. Now, in the wintertime, doesn't happen here much, they fall as snow in the winter. Now, where we live... Most of the time, those are going to fall do just like they do in summer here. When they fall into warmer temperatures, that's, that ice melts, and they fall as right. And I don't know if you've noticed this before. I did one time had a pen here. What did I do with it? There it is. Reggie's here. All right. Now, have you ever been outside on a hot, muggy day in the summertime and just out of nowhere the great big old drops of rain come and they, if you've been driving, they hit the windshield and almost scared you to death. They form these great big old blotches on the windshield. And if you've been out in them, it'll hit you on the head. Think, goodness gracious, that's a big drop of rain. You know you better head inside because that probably means there's going to be a lot more of them coming soon. Okay? Have you ever experienced that? Big old drops of rain in the summertime. Sort of you weren't expecting them. I bet you those were big old ice crystals somewhere there that kept getting formed and formed. We'll talk about that process. And when they finally fell, they were massive. Okay? But they had all melted. They were water. 
But you know, it's always cooler feeling that that rain than than it was the air was beforehand. Well, all that has to do. So that's what it is, uh, especially in the summertime. I would guess a lot of what we get. We may get some that is coalescent process. We're far enough south, we may get some of that. But most of what we get, I bet you, is at one time was ice. Now, we're going to talk later. There is actual ice that will fall in the spring and summer. What do we call that? We don't call it snow. Hail, exactly. And we're going to talk about how some of those ice crystals make it to the ground as hail stones. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So, what are the weather producers? This is section 23.2. What we did up till then, 23.1, to remind you, clouds and precipitation. How these things form. What we're going to talk about now is the processes by which weather is created. Now, here's the idealized model. This isn't strict. It isn't just happened this way, but this is idealized. The region about 10 degrees north and 10 degrees south of the equator, of course, in between that, receives the most direct solar radiation of anywhere on the planet. The sun is close to being directly overhead so much of the year, in fact, almost all year, in that 20 degree window, either side of the equator, 10 degrees either side. That's in the tropics, remember? The tropics go from 23 and a half degrees south to 23 and a half degrees north. So these are the ones closest to the equator inside of that. The air heats up, rises, and then as it rises, it spreads toward the poles. Okay? It's coming right off the equator, where the most direct solar radiation is coming. Okay? And it's just a really narrow band. Here's 15 degrees north and south, so 10 degrees will be about like this. This band right here is the band that gets the most direct solar radiation all year round. You notice how much of that band is water, okay? There's just not a lot of continent there. A little bit of South America and a fair amount of, of, of Africa, and just the very tip part of southern Asia. A little bit of the, the bottom part of India. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka and Tamil Nadu and those areas there, uh, on and around there. And the rest of it's mostly islands, all surrounded by water. So you get lots and lots of water, air heating up and rises. Well, when it rises, where's it going to go? It can't just keep rising, so it spreads out and goes toward the pole, either the North Pole or the South Pole. Well, what happens there is... And they don't say this, yeah, okay, we're going to get to that in a minute. I won't get ahead of myself or ahead of the slide. So now the air cools and becomes more dense as it rises, sinks back to the surface at latitudes around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. So here's 30 degrees north right here. There's 15, there's 30. Okay, 30 degrees north, 30. Ooh, look at where we are. We're 33 degrees. We're right in that band where the air comes back down. The air cools, becomes more dense, sinks back to the surface at latitudes 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. What's the end result? You get a band of low pressure near the equator. And guess what low pressure causes? Storms or low pressure centers. Hurricanes are low pressure centers. Tornadoes are low pressure centers. Okay? So, and that's where most of the hurricanes come from. That band uh, near the equator. Bands of low pressure near the equator. And bands of higher pressure at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator. And guess what? There's one of my other classes. It's the other physical science class. If, anyone, if any of you are taking that second mini-term, we'll be talking about this. We will actually do a lab, and one of the first things in the lab is to get the barometric pressure of Bessemer, Alabama at that time, close to 
real time. And students will pull out their cell phones, and those who have a weather app will get that. And what surprised me like crazy, because we are a little bit above sea level, you know, we've got several hundred miles before we reach the sea, and we're always going uphill all the time there. So I was just guessing our barometric pressure here would be a little bit lower than normal one atmosphere of pressure because we're at a slight elevation. I mean, we're in the area they call Red Mountain, Shade Mountain, all these mountains. We're not that high, but we're up above. And just about every time, we're more than one atmosphere of pressure. A couple times we've just been slightly below. Most of the time we're above. Every time we've done that. And here's why. Because we're in that band of higher pressure around 30 degrees north. We're at 33 degrees north. Now, large convective cells form to equalize the pressure. You got cool air, I mean, sorry, warm air leaving the equator going up, making low pressure. So now they get a cell that's trying to equalize that pressure. In other words, you got air moving up, so the other air is chiming in, and this creates some spinning. That's convective cells. And up here, where we are, we have the higher pressure, and we get convective cells trying to equalize that pressure. Okay? So, these form, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice, the weather producers. Now, what are these weather producers? One of the biggest is called an air mass. And before we turn the page here, um, there is just an absolutely gorgeous picture of an area, and they don't say where it is, uh, just before a thunderstorm is going to hit. In fact, you see the rain in the background. Just a tremendous picture. Those clouds look awfully dark, but that's because you're underneath them. The sun's Block the light area behind you is where the clouds are broken up, and you see how light it really is. <coughs> so let's talk about these air masses. These are partly the big scale weather producers. Okay, these are large, horizontally uniform bodies of air. And when they say horizontally uniform, the moisture and temperature conditions are just about the same in this large body of air. Now they list four main types or many subtypes, but they have the four main types. You have the continental air mass that's coming from the polar regions. Call it continental polar. Guess what? Cold. Polar. Cold. Continental, that indicates dryness. Because you see you don't have much moisture over a continent. Not that much. Maritime polar, on the other hand, Maritime, coming from the sea, mar is water, sea, okay, polar, that's cold air coming off water that's further to the north or south of you, the polar area. Then you have the continental tropical. This is usually tropical warm air, continental dry air, okay, and then the maritime tropical, huh, warm but very moist. So this is cold and dry, uh, cold and wet, warm and dry, warm and wet. We get a lot of warm and wet. Thank you, Gulf of Mexico. You send us all this maritime and tropical moisture up our way, air masses up our way. Now, These big air masses dictate what they call the air mass weather, the large scale weather action that you have going on. And these are weather conditions that remain the same over several days. You're talking this week here. I mean, we started wet type conditions, I think it was probably Sunday afternoon. And it hasn't changed much. I mean, we had a little bit of respite yesterday afternoon. I went to uh, Sam's on my way home. I didn't get wet there. I got all the way home, didn't get wet, but in no time it started raining. Last night when I went to put out the trash, it was, I got a little wet, okay. So, but generally, it's, and it's going to continue just about all week. This is air mass weather. Continues 
remains the same over several days. The weather changes when a new air mass moves in or when the air mass acquires a local condition. Okay? So either one of those two situations, a uh, new air mass moves in or when the air mass moderates and becomes more like the local weather. Okay. Now what do we mean by that? Here is a picture from the old edition. The one from the new edition has bigger air masses. Okay. Uh, so you can look at the one in your book, it's similar to this one, but not quite the same. Uh, figure 23.6 in your book on page 578. Okay. This just says little air masses here. Coming in from the northwest onto Washington and, and Oregon are generally maritime polar air masses. Moist air, but colder air. Now, they will produce rain, but not usually big, heavy thunderstorms. Back Seattle and I think Portland too, they measure the number of Sundays they see. Okay, how many days they actually get to see the sun, because it's almost always overcast and drizzly rainy. Probably not a lot unlike what we've got all week here. They have most of the year. But here from Canada, you have these continental polar. They're coming off land masses, and they're cold, but they're usually dry, okay? And uh, that's a continental polar. Here over here in Maine, you have the wind sweeping down what they call the nor'easters that come in off the North Atlantic, cold, but moist, and these would be uh, maritime pol uh, polar, yeah. On the southeast, especially on the Atlantic side, here you have maritime <coughs> polar, I mean maritime <laughs> tropical, coming in off the tropical region. Tropics are down here just below Florida, okay? Uh, so the water coming from here, I mean the, the air mass is coming from here, which do come, especially in the summertime, they get a lot of air like this, and that will be maritime tropical. Very moist, very warm air. Here, the Gulf of Mexico keeps this pumped up to us all the time. Okay, not all the time, but I mean, that's our predominant thing. Maritime, uh, uh, tropical air mass. Here in the what we call the desert southwest, because Southern California has the Mojave Desert in that. Okay, Arizona, New Mexico, almost, what, almost totally desert. Uh, West Texas, very dry. Why? Because their dominant air masses are continental tropical. Warm, hot air, but coming off Mexico, which is lost most of the moisture, so that's continental tropical. And then here in San Diego area, uh, Southern California, you get more of the maritime tropical. However, a lot of this, we'll do in the next chapter, we'll see the sea currents change a lot of this for us. But still, that's the air mass that you got. The one from your book shows massive air, you know, huge air mass here, here, there, there. And just, you know, this shows little bubbles. But hey, uh, I think the current edition is probably closer to reality. Okay? Um, now, what my guess is happening now, and Gary Tracy can straighten us out on this is that we had, for those days, you know, about the end of last week, it was a light jacket day. I think Friday was a pretty warm day. Uh, Saturday, I remember, was a cold day, uh, but I got out and was working, and I had to shed my warm jacket because it was just too heavy. Uh, but before that, we had a lot of uh, maritime tropical air, warm, moist air, and then here came uh, either a maritime tropical from the southwest or the continental tropical. One or the other is creating all this warm, moist air we had up here collided with this cold air coming from this way, and then that's why we've got the weather we are now. Up here, they're going to get ice and snow, winter storms like crazy. Because of that warm moist air brought it up, then the colder air is coming across. It may even be coming down from here, maritime polar, 
that's coming across like this. I don't know where the conflict is coming. Occasionally, it will be even continental polar. Uh, when it hits this maritime tropical, you can get some really severe weather then. Okay. So anyway, when those air masses hit, that's when they one of them bumps the other one out of the way, or this comes up here, settles in, and then slowly reaches uh, what do they call local conditions. Okay. So that's your air mass weather. Now, these create what they call the weather fronts, okay? And this will be... Now, in your text on page 579 is a figure probably taken very close to the same one at the very first that I said was the Gulf of Mexico. This is definitely the Gulf of Mexico, but this is more of a clear day. You can see the peninsula of Florida. You can see Cuba. You can almost make out Louisiana. It's under clouds again, but it always rains in Louisiana. Uh, and you see the bit of Texas coming down. You can't quite see where the Rio Grande comes in, but where that is, that would be uh, the border between Texas and Mexico. Okay, uh, so this is almost the same shot, but different conditions. Here, the one that's in your book here, <coughs> If we're on this slide, this almost, in my mind, is a front right here. Okay, warm moist air was over here, cooler, uh, probably continental air came in this way, and here you have the front where those two air masses collide. Okay, and that's what we're talking about here a weather front. Boundaries between the air masses at different temperatures. Warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico, cooler air from uh, continental polar, maritime polar, wherever it is, that different body air mass coming in, the boundary is what we call the weather front. <coughs> A cold front is when the cold air mass moves and displaces the warmer air mass. Well, where is it going to go? As the cold air mass comes in, it forces the warm air mass up. Now we see where they get that unstable situation. Here the cold air comes in, forces the warmer air mass up, and that's where you get unstable air. That's where you're going to have your rough weather. You could even have tornadoes, severe thunderstorms, that kind of stuff. The more rising air is cooled, leading to large cumulus and thunderclouds, you're going to have tough weather then. Now, I think that's what happened this week. We had warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico, and here came this cold air mass from the north, and that's where we've collided. Now, whether we're on that collision or we're south of it, it's hard to say. I'd have to see a weather map to see that. Now, a warm front, on the other hand, is when a cooler air mass is in place and then the warm moist air comes and pushes it out. Well now it's going to ride up over the top too and let me show you the illustrations of what these are. Well first one here uh, it seems like this one's out of place. This is more like your illustration on page 580 uh, figure 23-8 but they don't use an actual weather map, they just sort of draw one themselves. This is actually a weather map. Someone has drawn the lines in, but they based on what is out there. What you see here as highs are areas of high pressure. I don't want to make too big a deal about this, but this is that 30 degree north. And notice where these high pressure areas are just north of that, okay? Uh, that's what we were saying. Here's another high up here. Here's another high. Here's a high. Everywhere a high high. Very little low pressure on the map except right there. And that's probably one of those north nor'easters, they call it, coming down there. And here's the other thing this picture shows you. These 
lines that are here, curves that are here, that would be a better way of expressing it. They have numbers next to them. And these numbers are the barometric pressures. Now these, I think, are in what they call millibars, which is just one of the ways to measure that. Uh, most of the time we'll use inches of mercury or something like that, or centimeters of mercury. Um, but these are millibars, which are not too far off where what centimeters, uh, millimeters of mercury would be. But you see, here is a high pressure in circles. That is as high as that's going to get, somewhere in that circle. Here's another high pressure area inside this curve. This is a very broad high. The curve is not very, it's not even closed. This one's closed a little bit anyway. This one's a fairly broad one. But notice this low. Boy, is that ever enclosed. And here is the key. You see where these bars are really close together? Where the bars are close together means you have a large gradient there. Very low pressure here, going high very quickly. And when you have the bars close together, that means you're going to have very strong winds. So here is where I guarantee you on this day, the winds are the strongest of anywhere in the country. In here, you almost have any wind at all, okay? Just barely. A little bit of high pressure here and here, but you see they're very mild. Oh, here's another low, a little low sitting right there. But notice it doesn't even get encircled. It's just one little area of low pressure here. Maybe others. There's another little load here. All right. Now, these loads and this one, every load that you have here, you'll see there's a front. Okay? Now this, because of low pressure, the air in the northern hemisphere spins counterclockwise. So this is bringing cool air in, hitting warm, moist air here. That's where you're going to have some rainfall. That's where you have instability. Okay? Now, over here, and this is a cold front because the winds are pulling in like this. On this side of the load, it's a warm front because the warm, moist air from the ocean is being coming up against the cooler air that's here. Here is your uh, this would be your warm front here on this one, your cool front here up there. Another cold front there as well. In the high pressure, it circulates clockwise. So here it's doing warm, I mean, yeah, cold air turning this way against the warmer air that's here. So this is a cold front here. This is a warm front as the clockwise flow is bringing the warm air up and colliding with the cold. So the front is the boundary between those air masses. Here is a cold air mass hitting a warm that was in place, cold front moving in. Here, the, the uh, clockwise flow of air here is bringing the warm air up here into the colder air mass. Not much frontal activity on the globe that on the continent that day. But this shows a little bit. The picture in your book is just a drawing representing that type of thing, and uh, you'll see there's two highs and two lows. It's a lot more balanced. But again, where the barometric and those, by the way, are called isobars because all along that curve, you're at the same barometric pressure. Iso means same, same barometric, you call this the isobar. And they're increasing as you're going to the highs, they're decreasing as you're going to the lows. Okay. And the places where those isobars are more closely packed, that's where you have the greatest gradient between high pressure and low grade pressure. And you're gonna have the largest winds there trying to neutralize that. Okay, so let's take an actual look at our weather front. This is where the cold air mass is pushing in against the existing warm air mass. Say last week when we were nice and warm down here and the uh, uh, lots of humidity in the air, 
and this cold air mass came in, forcing the warm air up over the top and cooling it off, and that's where you get the moisture. So right now, we're somewhere back here where all that moisture is falling. Okay. Looking down from above, it's also a curve type here, so this is curving this way as well. The cold air mass pushing its way in, plowing under the warm air mass. Okay. That would be a cold front. This demarcation here and here. Two dimensional, three dimensional. Okay, the warm front on the <laughs> other hand, and I'm afraid it's not going to show this one. Well, not per se. Uh, here is the cold front coming in. I guess that's what we're doing it here this way. Why are those two blank slides are that? See, again, the cold air mass coming in, and it forces, this warm air was here in place. It's coming in, forcing the warm air up. When you force it up, you force it into one of these big cumulus clouds. When I say big, this is the altitude of that cloud in kilometers. That would be about nine miles high. Nine miles high, that cloud right there is. Okay? At nine miles, you're going to get ice formation. You're not going to be stuck around with uh, coalescence of water molecules, uh, of, of water droplets. You're going to have ice forming. And we'll talk about that in a little bit later, too. So this cold air is pushing the warm air up. This is the unstable air, unstable situation. The warm air mass being pushed upward, and it's, it's warmer uh, than the surrounding air. No, the surrounding air is warmer. Uh, you know, you'll have to go back and look at that graph. And anyway, it's forcing the rain. The rain happens before the front and after the front. I think we're behind the front now. Uh, so we're in this rainfall here, okay? And look at the distances involved here. This is from about 75 kilometers this side and probably 50 kilometers that way. That would be 30 miles behind the front and 45 <coughs> or so miles ahead of the front. Bands of rain, lots of rain. And depending on how fast it's moving, you could be in it. And that's the problem for us now. Well, there's a couple problems. The front is moving like this, and we're here on the side. And it just keeps moving, and we're just sort of sheared off of it. So we're just going to be all weak in this kind of condition. It's moving, but it's moving past us, kind of. Not over us, but past us. That's probably a pretty lousy description of it. So this is your cold front. Here, I think, is going to be the warm front. Now the cold air is in place, and the warm air is coming, but it can't plow it out of the way because it's less dense. So it climbs over the top. You still get cumulus clouds, but look at the difference. Those were 15 kilometers high. These are barely 5 kilometers high. Uh, that would be 3 miles high. Now, I think you still probably are going to get some ice crystals in that, but it's not nearly going to be as severe and, and major as it was in the other. So here the, the warm, moist air is trying to push the cold air out of the way, but because it's less dense, it just climbs over the top and creates a very gradual um, interface or front. And these are, and you see most of the time here, the rain is going to fall in the cold air mass. You know, it won't be as severe, it won't be as heavy a rain, and it'll cover a really broad area. Look at this. This is 0 to 400, maybe 475 kilometers. That's a long, long way. So this scale, much broader on the horizontal scale, much narrower on the uh, vertical scale. Does that kind of make sense? And after a while, all the moisture is dropped out of the clouds, and you get different clouds here. These were the cumulus clouds. These are cumulonimbus or something like that. 
and then finally the cirrus clouds up there, very thin, papery like clouds. So there's the warm front. The warm air advances over a cooler air mass, a long, gently sloping front. The clouds and the rain may form in advance of the front and just keep falling. And you know, yes, it could be that's what we're having here, but it just seems like this is a cold front rather than a warm front. I'd have to see the progression of the note. All right, then they mention stationary front, but they don't show anything about it. So let me just read, and there's coal, right? Okay, well, we wound up with fairly decent attendance today, except every now and then we lose people, but I guess most of them will come back, so that's good. So a stationary front is when the forces influence the warm and cold air masses become balanced and then the front just sits there, okay, without either one of them taking the upper hand. And there you could be in a, and that may be sort of like what we've got right now. Maybe where we are located is like a stationary front, and we're going to be in the same situation for days on end. Now, the bad news with that is that can cause, excuse me, local flooding. And I think they've already got some warnings out for that, don't they? In certain portions of the state. Up to the north, there are winter storm warnings, but I think down here, there are more flood warnings. Uh, because we've just had so much rain all winter, our ground is almost totally saturated. That's why I went out last Saturday and started digging in up some bamboo and stuff like that because the ground was just perfect for doing that kind of work. Just very loose. All right. Before we leave this, though, I did want to hit this. Top of page 581. Urban heat islands. Has anyone ever heard that phrase before? Urban heat island. Okay. Um, There have been some evenings, I'm going to say, last second mini term and fall term, okay? My fiscal science two class that was meeting in here, we didn't get through until 745 in the evening. I'll think it's bad be 5.45. We didn't finish until 7.45. They get started until 3.15 because they had, the automotive students had a, uh, their block schedule went until 2, and we couldn't start the class until, no, I'm sorry, it went until 3. They had a 1 to 3 o'clock block, so we couldn't start until 3.15, whereas we start this one at 1.15. So their, their uh, labs and, and end of the class went until 7.45 at night. So I was always after 8 leaving on Tuesday and Thursday. And I would get in my vehicle, and it has a thermometer in there, uh, you know, shows the outside temperature on the dash. Uh, and it would read, I'm just going to make up a number, say 48 degrees. So I would take off and start driving north, northeast actually, toward Birmingham. Okay, now, I know it wasn't that far in either direction there, but if anything, going north, you would expect the temperature to get a little cooler. And going east, this is at night, the sun would have set there earlier, not much earlier, a little bit earlier. So if anything, going east, you would expect it to be cooling a little faster. So I was going northeast, you would expect it to cool. Well, I'd leave here, let's just say 47 degrees. I drive a little ways, and sure enough, I would see a little bit of a temperature drop, maybe down to 46, possibly 45, okay? But at some point there, the temperature started rising, and it stopped rising, and it kept rising the closer I got to Birmingham. And when I got into Birmingham, I had sometimes gone up five or 
or six degrees from what it would have been here at West Point. It's further to the north, further to the east, and yet the temperature was rising. Why? Because Birmingham is what we call a heat island. Where was that? Oh, that was on the book. Okay, uh, 581. Uh, they have a good little blurb about it, and uh, I'll let you read that. There are some questions. If that spurns you toward a paper topic, please take it, folks. This one of my best classes of all time, right? I've received three out of, I think we've got maybe 18 students now. That's one-sixth of the students have turned in a paper, and we've got what? Less than three weeks left, right? So please, don't forget to get your papers in. Okay. So, um, a few of the reasons for that. Of course, green leafy trees are going to absorb more energy than they give off because they're photosynthesizing, okay? Buildings are not going to you know, uh, absorb energy. They will actually reflect energy. Pavement actually will absorb the heat and then maintain the heat, especially if it's dark colored. So you've got all these things going on inside a city that you don't have in a more rural area. That's one reason. Another reason is think <laughs> of all the buildings there in the wintertime heating those buildings so they're producing heat. In the summertime, they're, take, they're air conditioning, which means they're cooling the inside of the building. But have you ever been outside near where the AC unit blows the air away? That air is awfully hot because that's the refrigeration process. You're cooling the inside, blowing the heat to the outside. So you have all these air conditioning units pumping hot air out to keep the inside of the buildings cool. And you've got all the traffic, burning fossil fuels, producing more heat. And those, that heat gets trapped. Okay? So, urban heat islands. All right. Now let's move to waves and cyclones. Uh, now, there's going to be an illustration with this, too, which is another one of these that I don't think is particularly instructed in my mind, but we'll, I'll show it. Here's the mechanism. They call them bulges or waves often formed between oppositely moving air masses. Okay? And they really don't describe what they mean by a bulge or a wave there. Uh, but if one air mass is coming in here, another air mass is here, I guess what they mean, a bulge, you get too much air in one place, you know, it, it's, you know, it's all being forced together, and that the form of that could be called the wave. They often form between the opposite moving air masses. The overriding uplifted cold air, which makes no sense, okay, because the cold air should be dropped below. But if some does get forced upward, could be an unstable situation, produces a low pressure area. Further cold front motion leads to an occluded front and a cyclonic storm. So basically the procedure here, now this is correct. You get a low pressure area and that leads to a cyclonic storm. Now this is harkening back to what we just were saying before. And so let's look, what is a cyclone then? A low pressure area with inflowing Upward force winds, okay? Again, low pressure meaning the winds, uh, the, the air, uh, and again, it seems backwards, okay? But it, it is correct, but it just seems backwards that you would have the low pressure would be upward force winds. It seemed like the low pressure would be forcing winds down. But see, the low pressure is sucking winds up. So uh, that's what's going on there. Low pressure is sucking it up. Now, anytime you have vertical motion, it doesn't just go up. Because guess what? The earth is spinning underneath it. If the earth is spinning underneath it, you have a <coughs> torque there. 
the air spinning, the air moving up. But you see, the air moving up isn't moving. It looks like it's straight up, but the Earth's at an angle here, you know. So it has this this bend to it or twist, and that circulation pattern is caused by what we call the Coriolis effect. Okay. Remember, I said the high pressure areas, the wind circulates clockwise. Low pressure area counterclockwise. That's because of the Coriolis effect. The high pressure area, the winds are pushing down, and the spin of the Earth creates a clockwise flow. When the low pressure area, the air is sucked up because of the low pressure, and the uh, spin of the Earth that creates a counterclockwise flow. Okay. That's the Coriolis effect. There's a potential paper topic. Who is Coriolis? What is the Coriolis effect? There's two or three topics I can think of right there just dealing with this. What is its effect on weather? Okay. Now, did I tell you the story of the physics teacher who had the meetings down in Rio de Janeiro? I didn't tell you that. Okay. Because we are a globe, and we're a spinning globe, and we're up here in the temper area, and the spinning, you see, the globe is like this. Okay. Downward is this way, but notice that's at an angle, right? And the earth is spinning like this. That creates an angle. And that's why a low pressure area is going to produce a counterclockwise flow. Sounds like a really dumb question. It really sounds dumber than it really means. Have you <coughs> ever noticed when you pull the plug in your sink, does the water just look like this? Or does it go like this? It spins. The reason is the earth spins. And that's the Coriolis effect. Now, notice every time you pull the plug in your sink, every time, or tub, or whatever, every time you pull that, notice it's just like always, I would say always, the flow is counterclockwise. Always. That's because we're in the Northern Hemisphere. Dr. Young was the name of my physics teacher. I had two courses, uh, later a third course when I was still in tech. Two when I was undergraduate, one when I was in grad school. But he was a honcho in, in uh, crystallography. I didn't tell you the story when we were doing the crystals. Okay. But because he was a honcho in crystallography, he was actually editor of one of the big journals. I mean, he was a honcho. And they had, had decided to have the international meetings that year in Buenos Aires, no, I'm sorry, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Now, Rio de Janeiro is not the largest city in Brazil. It's pretty close to it, though. San Paulo is here. That's the largest city. It's a capital of industry and that kind of stuff. Hard working city. Rio, not too far from it, but on the coast, it's party city, US, I mean, Brazil. And I mean party city. It's, it's colorful, it's just, they know how to play down there. So here, Dr. Young had his crystallography meeting, at an international meeting, in Rio de Janeiro. And it was the first year he had ever, the first time he had ever been south of the equator. And he said he was just so excited to be there. He just couldn't wait to go into his room and flush the toilet to watch the water go down clockwise. Because he was in the southern hemisphere then, and a low pressure there is clockwise flood, high pressure is counterclockwise because they're south of the equator, and their down is like this, or, down is like this, and you see that's at an angle, 
of the spin, and that's going to create a different spin. And sure enough, that's why he was excited to be in the party city of South to the Southern Hemisphere, so he could watch the water play down in his toilet in a clockwise manner. That's the Coriolis effect. Now, an anticyclone is a high pressure area where you have clockwise flow, not anticlockwise. Here the air is sinking because the high pressure is forcing it down. Warm relative humidity is lowered, and therefore you don't get a weather system out of that. In fact, I was going to say that thing that we flashed earlier, I was going to suggest that may have been in the summertime or getting close to the summertime, but not far from summer, because there was so much high pressure there and very little low pressure except way in the far northeast because that's typical of what we see here. So here is their uh, illustration of what they've been doing. And again, this is one I find not particularly all that instructive. Well, obviously you have an unstable air situation. If you have the warm air on the bottom moving this way and the cold air on top moving that way. That's a problem, folks, because cold air is wanting to sink and warm air is wanting to rise. So that's what happens here. The warm air does push up, and that may be what causes the bulge here, uh, creating a warm front on this side, but a cold front on that side, because this is where uh, the, uh, the cold air is coming over the bulge and coming down here. And again, it's not a particularly instructive slide to me. I don't know what scale they're measuring this on. Okay? Warm front on that side, cold front on this side. Well, because you have the cold air sinking, the warm air rising, you tend to form a low pressure right here in front of that. Okay? And where the warm air is rising and the cold air is sinking behind it, so you get low pressure here, warm, uh, higher pressure on this side. And this is what they then say is an occluded front. And they don't really define that too much. But that circulation of air, low pressure, uh, and again, I could have told you that at the very beginning, that's what you're going to get. But that's where you're going to get your big weather maker. You will have a drop in temperature, You'll have likelihood of rainfall, possibly cyclonic storms, thunderstorms, possibly even tornadoes. Okay. Now, it seems like this slide here is a little ahead of itself because we haven't even talked about tornadoes. But these are the paths that tornadoes can take. Cyclonic storms usually follow principal storm tracks across the continental U.S., generally easterly direction. Now you might say, why is that an easterly direction? Why do we have prevailing westerly winds? Because the earth is spinning like that, you would think the winds would be east to west, not west to east. Well, near the equator, they are. That's exactly right. But you see, the Earth is dragging these winds. You know, the wind trying to, the atmosphere is trying to stay where it is. The Earth is spinning under it. And that's why near the equator, you have easterly flowing winds. That's why in the summertime, when the hurricanes form, they form off the coast of Africa and they come across this way because that's the prevailing easterlies in the tropic area. But up here in the temper area, the Earth is spinning slower compared to what it is here because it's going one time around. This is a long distance. This is a short distance. So the relative speed is less. So that sucks up the air that's moving this way in the tropics and then it moves this way in the temperate area because the wind speed from where the wind, the Earth has drug the wind along, giving it more speed than the ground speed is here. That makes prevailing westerly wind. So, these typically come from the West, and the ones that get the most attention is this one that goes through Oklahoma, okay? And 
Arkansas, or the ones that come through Kansas and Missouri, and some further north. But more recently, like 2011, wasn't it? This was where they were coming. And think about it. This was the area that that big, was it April of 2011? Have I got the year right? Where we had that just massive chain of tornadoes coming right this way. They came right across from Mississippi and into Alabama, and they were massively destructive. Okay. Again, that looks like there. We already talked about cyclones, but we haven't even gotten to tornadoes yet. So that was, seems like this slide's a little out of place. All right, now we're ready to hit that. And these are our major storms. This is subtopic, uh, on, or this is on page, major storms subtopic on page 582. Waste and cyclones are there. And wait a minute. It's 3.15, isn't it? This is time for us to stop this and move to lab. So, major storms will be where we pick up next time. Okay? Now, we've got to finish weather and then move into climate. So, we've got a fair amount of traveling to do yet in this chapter. Uh... So, sorry, I didn't make as much progress as I thought I would today, but then we've only had two hours. Next time we'll have two and a half hours. I'm pretty certain that we will finish chapter 23 next time. Okay? And then, because we won't have a lab to do, we'll get started in 24, which is good because we're running out of term. And if we go on two field trips next week, that won't give us much time to, to cover too much of 24. So we still have one day, Tuesday of the following week, to, uh, to finish up 24. So I think we can get it all done, but we'll see. So let's end at major storms here. And the slide a little bit later. Uh, but you each have now a copy of the lab, right? Okay, a few people aren't back yet. Um, if you remember the last lab, those of you who were here for it, we talked about, we had several maps here, okay? One of the ones was actually a road map. That was one of the U.S., but it had latitude and longitude on it so we could use it. Uh, the one that we used from Alabama was, if you'll notice the name of it, it's Alabama uh, Atlas and Gazetteer. That doesn't mean a lot, but down here it says topo map of the entire state. What do we mean by topo? Topographic maps. This is what we're talking about today. That street map that we use uh, that for the uh, latitude longitude of cities in the U.S., that would give you the information that you'll find on here. Okay, so this is a topographic map. Okay? Now, you have other maps that are geologic maps. Uh, show the distribution of different rock bodies exposed at the Earth's surface frequently uh, include features found on topographic maps. This globe is kind of a geologic because you can feel the mountain ranges here. Okay? Uh, if you want to feel them sometimes, they're there. Over here in the Himalayas, I mean, way, yeah, really big ridge right there. Uh, so you can feel those are geologic maps, okay? Now, that's just the introduction. This is on page four, 345 of your, your map, of your lab, front page. Okay, they show an actual picture of, well, a drawing of a picture of a uh, looks like a bay here, okay? And you can see that there is a really abrupt rise here, cliffs on this side, sort of a gradual rise on that side, okay? You've got the ocean down here at sea level, or whatever that is, okay? In between, you have a valley coming through here, and what we have here, down here is in a topographic map, 
that is trying to reflect what you see going on up there. Okay? You can almost pick out the ridge, the, the highest point there, by this topographic map here. Before that, you're going up. And notice how close the lines are together. Remember when I was talking about the... Uh, the barometric pressure map that we were doing in the isobars, uh, lines of equal barometric pressure. Well, these are lines of equal elevation. These are called isoclines, lines of equal elevation. So there, near the body of water, everything's at the same level. There aren't any lines down there. But then when you come in, when you see the lines are, this is not a great picture, but the lines are fairly wide apart where it's nice and flat, but when you get steeper and steeper, they get closer and closer together because the lines, you're getting to higher elevations really soon, right afterwards. So you have the steepest lines of elevation here, whereas over on this side, even though it's a higher mountain, uh, or it looks like it is, actually they show it's not, uh, but almost the same size, it's very gradual going up. And you see these ridges where you have the little dips in there? Those are the angles here. That would be where you have little valley, uh, yeah, valleys coming down the mountain. Okay, so that's an illustration of it. The next page gives you some really important points about topographic maps. Please read the front, but please read the second page. That is really, really important. Okay? Now, materials, we don't have soft plate. We're not going to be doing that. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, so, most of the materials and procedures we won't be doing. What we're going to do is jump right to the results. Okay? What do topic graphic maps show? Basically, the first page and the second page between those two pages, and in fact, I think that question is almost totally on the first page. You should be able to get the question or answer right there. What is the relation between the closest of contour lines and the steepness of slope? I have a feeling that's going to be more on the second page in those items they list there. Okay, that's page four, four, 346. And then... Question three, what happens as con to contour maps across the valley? I'm almost certain that's on 346. It may be a little bit on 345, mostly on 346. And how would a nearly vertical cliff be represented on a contour map? Well, in between what you read on the first two and stuff, I think you can probably figure that one out too, okay? But you might find something fairly close to what will give you the answer on page 346. All right, then you can wait and do number five until after you're through with it all if you want to. So there's five points worth. Then notice the next page, 349. It says, invitation to inquiry. Now, some of you with phones or with computers, the computers are probably going to be a little bit better. If, now, I don't know if this website they give you here is currently working or not. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But in case it doesn't, you can Google or any other search that you want to do. I do have, yeah. Uh, you can uh, go to Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming. Locate that somewhere on the internet. Okay? Locate that. And also, while you're doing that, put topographic map or relief map. Either one of those time terms should do it for you. Topographic map or relief map. Okay? And Devil's Tower uh, National Monument in Wyoming. Okay? And then from that, you should be able to answer what you've read on the first two pages, and you should be able to answer those five questions. Okay? So there's ten points worth. Okay? And y'all, it is a lab. Work together. Those who have computers or phones and can find the sites, work with those who can't. You know, so all of you get together and do that.
Now that's 10 points worth. 25 point flat, right? Got to have 15 more points. Okay? And here's what we're going to do for that. That's why I brought this topographic map here. Okay? Now, this is the state of Alabama. Now, if you want to, you can start with the page where you live. And my guess, most of you, that would be uh, pages 30 and 31. There, there's two pages here. Uh, and let me show you the topographic lines here. Okay? Let me pick another page that may be... Ah, this is... I want to do the one y'all are going to do. Okay. Pick a number between... 16 and 64. Well, I don't use 64. Pick a number between 16 and 40, say. 34. 34. Okay. I'm going to go to page 34 here. Okay. Not quite as good a one as I would have thought it would be. So pick a little bit lower number than 34. 25. Okay, 25. Okay, this is a little bit better. Any of you familiar with uh, Colvin, Alabama? Yes, sir. What's that? I've got some friends up there. Okay. Um, now, that's what this is an uh, illustration. I mean, that Colvin's on page 24. You said 25, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or whoever said it. Hansel is on 25. That's where. Wallace State Hansville lives. Okay. Now, near Hansville, I see here. Okay, there's all sorts of colored lines over here. There's lines that are dotted lines with a yellow highlight. Those are county boundaries. Don't get confused by those. Okay. Those are just county boundaries. There are blue things. That's rivers or streams or creeks or things like this. Or bigger things would be lakes. Okay? For so here's Gunnersville up in the right corner, upper right corner, and there's Gunnersville Lake right there. Okay? Now there's also red lines on here. Big red lines are major highways with yellow in them, or even bigger highways. But even the little bitty red lines are county roads or whatever. Don't get confused by them. Okay? What we're looking for is sort of a tannish kind of line, or a, I guess you would say tan, grayish kind of line. And you'll see some right here. And you see there's a little circle, and then, or not a circle, a curve, and inside the curve. What that is showing, those are your topographic lines. Okay? They're, they're sort of grayish kind of lines. And what you're to do here, given a page, and don't go to way south in Alabama because you're not going to find many. South Alabama is very flat. You're not going to find a lot of close, closely spaced lines, topographic lines. So go to any of the pages, I'd say from, I'd say from 16 to 33. Probably some of the others will do too, but 16 to 33, pick you, uh, and they come in pairs. Like I said, 31 and 30 and 31 are together. Uh, we were just looking at 24 and 25. So pick a pair of pages like that, okay? And what you're to do is find, and I'll, I'll put it on here. Okay? So on your piece of paper, and this may be the back page of your lab if you want to do it there. 
You got, okay. You got room to answer those five questions there on page 347 and 348. I think you got plenty of room to answer the five questions on, on uh, Devil's Tower on page 349. So on the back side, but if you want to use notebook paper, that's fine too, or, or plain white paper, whatever. But you got plenty of room here if you want to do it. And what you're to do, and I'd say maybe make it like this, but you can do it either way you want to. Here would be the topics that I would do. First thing I want you to record are your page numbers, okay? Page numbers. And again, they're going to come in pairs, like this page we're on now is 2425. You may not want to use that one, but the page numbers. That's going to be first. And then what you want to do is the next column, you want to find you want to find where the topographic lines are close together. Now this one is not necessarily a super good one, but you can find them fairly close together. And when you find them close together, and I'm finding one right down here, uh, find some feature. It may be a town, it may be a swamp, it may be a river, it may be uh, anything that's listed there close by, uh, maybe even a road or something like that, near where those close topographic lines are. So find a feature with close topographic lines. And these are called, let me just write the name for them. You'll see this in your reading. Contour lines. That's what we call them. They're isoclines, but really the common name for them are contour lines. Close contour lines. Okay. Now, goodness gracious. that's the next column. A feature with close contour lines. The next column will be what does that mean? What do close contour lines mean? Okay. Then find a feature where you hardly can find any contour lines. Now, don't have that in a city. They'll, they will not list the contour lines in a city because they got all the street lines there and it's really hard to see. But places out in the open where you don't see many contour lines. So, a uh, feature with widely spaced contour lines. Okay, and then what do they mean? Okay, so there's your headers, and what you need to do is find, I'm not suggesting you use 24 or 25, say 24, 25, 30, 31, whatever. Whatever pairs of numbers that you have that open up like this, okay, put the page numbers there, and then find the features and tell what they mean, and do this for four different sp spreads of pages, okay? That would be 4 times 4 is 16 more points worth that you get from that, right? So there's your other, you needed 15 points, you're going to get 16, okay? You're, it'll be based on 25, however many you get, okay? Is that making sense? Okay, so what I suggest any of you, all of you can be working on those first two pages, okay? Or you can go to your fine Devil's Tower monument and be working on that, or you can be working on the book. And remember, multiple ones of you can work together on any one of those three features at a time. So it's only got one book, you got several computers, and all of you have a lab. So spread it out so you can get those done. Uh, Knock yourself out. Any questions? Okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. question. Um, oh! Yeah. Ah. I thought you say something earlier. Okay. 
I think you can see this even with the lights on, but uh, if we need to, we'll turn it off. But let's wait till it comes up. I thought that was on. Sorry about that. It is coming. Page numbers, features, some features near where you have close contour lines, and what does that mean? Features where you have widely spaced contour lines, what does that mean? And do that for four different page numbers, sets of page numbers. Can y'all read that okay? Y'all can make it a little neater than mine, but you got the general gist, right? Can you see it? That would be, in my mind, that would be the last page. You know, set up the last page that way. There's four top, five, five columns across the top, and then you put four uh, sets of page numbers. Okay. If you have any questions, ask. Okay. Now, my question to you: Do you think you're going to have anything that? Your questions might be beneficial to be recorded, or you don't know enough yet. I'll just pause this, uh, but then when you think you got it down, no more questions, then I'll start uploading this so it'll get uploaded sooner. What you think? Okay, so we do two sets of page numbers. Okay. And we did four for each of the pages. Okay. Like, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, okay. Say a pair of pages here, and let's say I'll just make up the number that's probably not even on there. 48 and 49. Okay? Find some feature near where you have close contour lines. Write that feature down. Okay? And then what does that mean? What does it mean to have close contour lines? That can be from your reading there. Okay? That should tell you. And then features where you hardly see any contour lines at all, widely spaced contour lines. Some feature that's say sitting in that. What does that mean? That's your next one. So you see, you have four sets of pages: 48, 49, uh, 38, 39, 26, 27. You know, four sets of pages, pairs of pages like that, and then find on those sets of pages. Now, if you can't find any, ask me. And if it's any in South Alabama, I'll probably look for a while and say. Go to more pages, okay? Because some of those are so flat, you don't even find the contour lines on there. They're flat, so widely spaced apart, you don't get any that are close. So get some pages in northern Alabama that will have these features on them, okay? And I think you'll find these almost all mean the same, close to the same thing on that. So it really isn't all that creative. But uh, I just want you to get into the habit of thinking that. Okay? So be answering your five questions. Be uh, looking up Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming or using the atlas. We only have one atlas, so make good use of that. and. Again, work together on all of those pieces that you want to. You know, groups of two or three, individually, five or six, I don't care how you do it. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to pause this for now, but as soon as there's a question, ask. And